The international economy and America's policies and strategies within it. Uh, for many of us, this time is uh, extraordinarily interesting because we're witnessing a global redistribution of power, perhaps. And uh, it's interesting the pace at which that might take place. We're certainly witnessing sovereign funds, national sovereign funds, uh, actions on the part of major powers, certainly China, to uh, achieve strategic advantages in the international economy, to say nothing of the perennial questions which are always with us with respect to the international economy. So the thinking of the American government and the policies which they uh, are developing, especially within this, this interesting context, are of great interest to us. And we'll certainly have more programs in 2008 on the topic. But we're absolutely, we're deeply pleased to uh, have a senior representative of the United States government with us tonight, the Assistant Secretary for Economic, Energy, and Business Affairs at the Department of State. Uh, Mr. Sullivan is a graduate from uh, Harvard University with a Bachelor of Arts degree in economics. Uh, he graduated uh, uh, magna cum laude from Harvard. And uh, he holds a joint degree from Georgetown University, a uh, Doctor of Jurisprudence, and a Master of Science uh, in Foreign Service with uh, specialties in international uh, uh, economics and international uh, security, as well as, as the law, of course. Um, he uh, clerked, as law people do, once for the, uh, for, for the uh, uh, in the Court of Appeals in the Ninth Circuit. He also was a clerk uh, serving the, uh, uh, the judicial system in, in Alaska. He worked for a time as a member of the uh, law profession in the government. He has served with the National Security Council and the National Economic Council um, in the Director of International uh, uh, Economics and reported, therefore, to both uh, Mrs. Uh, Ms. Rice in the National Security Council as well as the head of the uh, uh, National Economic Council. Uh, in that, he specialized in international trade. He worked, uh, he focused upon three of the, the great conferences of the time, G8, uh, APEC, and uh, uh, the Americas. Uh, he, uh, as Marine, Reserve officer. He's been called to duty recently. He served with Central Command, being a special assistant to the commander of Central Command from uh, during the time period early 05 into mid 06, and then also uh, 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 served within their theater of operations. After that, he became Assistant Secretary of State, the position which he holds now. Uh, his responsibilities are comprehensive and enormous. Trade and finance and, uh, and investment and the worrying about the funding for terrorists and, and seven or eight other major aspects of the comprehensive view of American international economic policy. He'll talk tonight about uh, uh, not just the context which we're confronting, but American leadership and policies with respect to it. Uh, in doing that, he's entitled his remarks, as you can see, the Bush administration's economic foreign policy. Uh, and of course, uh, that's what we want to hear. The government of the United States uh, in this interesting uh, and somewhat debatable uh, area of policy. It's my great pleasure to present to you the Assistant Secretary of State, Mr. Daniel Sullivan. Thank you, Dr. Bird. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. Um, I want to thank the Council on Foreign Affairs for the invitation. It's a great turnout. Um, and uh, I, I must say, reviewing the speaker lists that you have had over the last several years, it's, uh, it's quite an impressive one. I, I'm not, I, I, I hope I feel up to the task. Fortunately, I've seen a lot of my colleagues at the State Department, uh, the Bush administration, the White House, who have been here. So uh, 
I know that they survived uh, the evening. Um, uh, but in all seriousness, um, I personally very, very much uh, highly value these kind of interactions. Uh, I end up, in all seriousness, learning as much from my audience as uh, the audience learns from me, uh, probably in every occasion. So what I, what I really want to uh, intend to do tonight is go over a couple things. We have a little bit of a slideshow to keep this a bit interactive. Hopefully some of you, uh, all of you can see it. Uh, discuss some of the policies that, that I've been working on that are, I think, uh, may surprise you a little bit. They don't get a lot of press, but uh, pretty impressive. And, um, and then really have an uh, exchange of ideas, interests. I'm always very, very interested to hear what's on the minds of um, uh, people outside the Beltway, because I think in a lot of ways this is really where the issues that matter the most, particularly on the international economic side, uh, come to fruition, and I, I'm, I'm very interested in hearing about it. I also should say it's great to be in Baltimore. Um, uh, although I have to admit, this used to be, uh, from my perspective, probably, this sounds a little harsh, uh, but uh, kind of enemy territory for me, being uh, born and raised in Cleveland, Ohio, <laughs> and having lost my beloved Browns to Baltimore. And then you had the audacity to actually go and win the Super Bowl when we still didn't even have a team. But now that we got our team back, I think our record's a little better than yours right now. Uh, <laughs> all is forgiven. I've actually even been to a Ravens game, I'll have you know, with a distinguished member of Baltimore society a few years back. So uh, we're OK there. All right? I just want to, but I thought you guys should all know that. Um, but what I want to do uh, tonight, as is, uh, is, is mentioned, is discuss uh, briefly on what I think is really, in many ways, an overlooked story uh, of an important, in many ways, a critical element uh, of the Bush administration's policies over the last several years in the area that I work in, which is the international economic uh, and development area. And uh, Lexi, if you can hit that. Um, and really kind of look at, look at this record, discuss it, a lot of facts here that you may or may not be familiar with, and then talk about why it matters, why it matters to the average American, why it matters to businesses, but why it matters even more broadly than that in terms of our uh, critical foreign policy and national security interests, and then really talk about, at least from our perspective, some of the key things that we think uh, need to be accomplished in the next year. Um, as I note here, uh, the, the intellectual foundations of the administration's international economic policy were set very early in the uh, administration. In 2002, uh, I was working at the National Security Council staff. That's when the National Security Strategy document of 2002, which gained a lot of attention uh, for issues relating to preemption and things like that. But there was also very, very strong chapters. And you go back, look at the White House website, and read these on what the administration was planning to do with regard to its international economic and development policies. You, hear, you see here chapter, uh, chapter 6 uh, noted as the core uh, goal to set out and to ignite a new era of global economic growth through uh, uh, free markets and free trade. And uh, chapter seven talks about expanding the area of development uh, and uh, uh, the, the infrastructure of democracy. And what I want to, again, mention here, since then, with the, and this is a key issue, with the very, very strong backing of a bipartisan Congress, uh, the administration has step, uh, steadily implemented this strategy and where I want to talk about tonight are in three areas, what I call revolutionizing our approach to development assistance, uh, opening international markets and leveling the playing field for our workers, businesses, farmers, and setting the conditions for strong domestic economic growth and historic, historic, and you'll look at the numbers and see them, global economic growth. And so as I mentioned, look a, uh, a little bit at the uh, record bit of a cheerleading session, I'll admit, but then talk about really why this matters so much and the bipartisan work that needs to be carried out. Next slide. So on the first point, 
uh, revolutionizing development assistance. In 2002, uh, at the Monterey Summit uh, in Mexico, which was a very big UN summit, uh, uh, the president talked about a new compact with regard to development assistance. And the new compact really consisted of two things. It consisted of developed countries dramatically increasing their, what we call ODA, official development assistance. And the developing countries, countries receiving that assistance uh, to be um, implementing more responsible policies. As many of you know, particularly with regard to international, or particularly with regard to domestic economic growth. As many of you know, one criticism that's occurred with regard to development assistance really over the decades uh, has been, you know, hasn't been that effective. It's gone to uh, regimes that aren't taking care of their people. Uh, it's fueled corruption, things like this. So this was a kind of a big, uh, what we believe was an intellectual breakthrough with regard to uh, this approach to the new compact and revolutionizing development assistance. So if you look at the numbers, and again, this is a story that I don't think is very widely known, but these are facts. If you look at the numbers on the developed country side, from the U.S. perspective, we certainly uh, kept our end of the bargain with regard to a dramatic, dramatic increase in development assistance. This is obviously the administration, but it's also Congress, which funds this, uh, since 2000. So you look at the, uh, well, just the, the, the aggregate numbers, the largest increase year to year in development assistance in any period in American history since the Marshall Plan. Uh, and there's some of the numbers. I won't go through all of them, but quadrupled, quadrupled development assistance levels uh, since from the last year of the Clinton administration to current years. Um, more than doubled the assistance to Latin America. As I mentioned, the Monterey Compact talked about increasing ODA by 50 percent. We did that three years early. Um, and there's some, another, a bunch of other areas here where, again, where the increases were dramatic, bipartisan, dramatic increases, which, as I mentioned, and I think hopefully you'll, you'll agree with me by the end of this presentation, these are issues that in a way are very bipartisan. They're issues that as Americans, whether you are a strong Republican, strong Democrat, that by and large you feel good about because they help people. And I think these policies ultimately, because they're reflected through the Congress, reflect the generosity of the American people. Next slide. Now one area in particular that relates to this is the area, in the area of combating disease, global health issues. And again, these are areas that uh, they don't get a lot of press, but they are dramatic and impressive. And the first one is what we call the uh, PEPFAR, President's Plan for uh, Emergency AIDS Relief. And this was an initiative announced by the President at the State of the Union, 2003, $15 billion over five years to address global HIV AIDS, uh, primarily in Africa. And um, uh, we did that. As a matter of fact, it came to about $18 billion. And um, you note there, under this program, big issue. Uh, the United States does more than the rest of the world combined. Again, something every American should be proud of. Uh, I mentioned here the, the next bullet, last year's G8 summit, I had the, I call it now the good fortune at the time, I didn't think it was the good fortune, of being what's called the Sioux Sherpa in the G8 negotiations. So uh, me and the Sherpa, I was under the Sherpa, we were the two negotiators for the president uh, over a course of about six months for the German G8 summit. So the leader's statement that comes out of the G8 summits was uh, something that I negotiated with my colleague. Um, and I'll just give you this anecdote because I think it's very revealing. About two weeks prior to the G8 summit in Heiligendamm, Germany last year, uh, last summer, um, there was a debate on the PEPFAR program was getting ready to run its course, and there was a big discussion on what uh, we would do with regard to, uh, to reauthorizing it. Another 15 billion over five years, or something more dramatic. What ended up happening was that the president chose to actually double it. So on the eve of the summit, uh, 
uh, he requested from Congress a $30 billion commitment. Uh, I was uh, instructed to go to the G8 because we thought what the G8 was trying to do this past year on this very important issue, which has been a focus of G8, was uh, rather weak. And so I tabled a proposal that essentially uh, took what the president's program was going to do and double it. So have the rest of the G8 uh, match what the United States of America was going to do. And to give you a little inside baseball in these negotiations, Initially, every country, with the exception of the UK, said, no way. Too late in the summit negotiation process, uh, too much money, we can't afford it, and we're not going to do it. To which I said, well, look, this is a very important issue for my president, and when he comes here, I need to bracket this text in the leader statement, because when he comes here, he's going to raise this issue with each of your leaders. And we negotiated, negotiated. And by the end, uh, by the summit, the eve of the summit, the big outcome, if you look at the papers from last uh, G8 summit, in addition to the climate discussions, was this uh, G8 commitment, $60 billion G8 commitment to address uh, global HIV AIDS issues primarily in Africa. 110% President of the United States made that happen, period. I was the guy who, who made it happen. And again, something every American uh, should be very proud of. One interesting note, on the eve of the summit, when it looked like it was going to happen, the Germans leaked to the press that this was their initiative, and so that's the way these things happen. But trust me, it wasn't. Um, but there's a number of other areas. I won't, uh, I won't go into them, but a focus on malaria, uh, a focus on uh, other diseases, uh, humanitarian assistance. Again, this is a record with regard to increasing dramatically the uh, levels of development assistance that uh, even though you don't read about it that much, those are the facts. Next slide. Now, on the other side, with regard to revolutionizing, there was, we talk about the policies. The administration has uh, perhaps, I think, one of the most important initiatives of the entire administration, what was called the Millennium Challenge Account, and that, uh, that morphed into what's called the Millennium Challenge Corporation. And that is the way in which we are uh, significantly uh, dispersing uh, a lot of this increase in development assistance. And the way this is done, it's through a corporation, again, bipartisan. Uh, Secretary of State is the chairwoman of the board. But it's through a corporation that has private sector individuals that are um, nominated by both parties uh, in the Congress. And what it does, it ranks countries. It looks at countries with individual, uh, nonpartisan indicators that relate to three general areas, ruling justly, investing in people, and promoting economic freedom. And how countries do on these accounts and the indicators, there's several, several indicators uh, under each of these three broad areas. How they do on these accounts is, is is primarily how we, we choose to disperse aid under the MCC program. So it's become something that focuses on the, the, uh, the very good performers within the international uh, developing area to encourage the kind of uh, uh, good economic policies, good uh, social policies that we think help spur economic growth and reduce poverty. So uh, that is something that's occurred, again, over the last several years. And what you're seeing and what I've seen as I travel is what we call the MCC effect, where countries who haven't even received programs yet, haven't even received money yet, because they know these programs are meant to be very big, and they are very big. El Salvador, for example, has a half a billion dollar MCC compact. Um, so they're meant to be transformative that they can really, really reshape an entire society. Um, and the countries are meant to own these programs. They design the programs once they get them in conjunction with the MCC and MCC programs in the countries. But this MCC effect, I have seen countries where they, they talk to you about, hey, we're reforming our judiciary, we're reforming our economy. They're taking actions on the good governance front, on the good economic policy front, because they want to be part of the program. So we think that that has been a very effective way in which to uh, 
uh, encourage good governance, encourage good private sector-led growth policies, even before a country uh, receives any development assistance. And so uh, I've seen that, and if you want to talk about that in a little bit more detail during the Q&A period, I would love to. It's something, again, that uh, we focus on a lot, and it's something that uh, is really making a difference in, all, uh, in several countries throughout the world. Next slide. Now, one other point uh, I wanted to mention here, it's an interesting slide, but uh, you'll see sometimes uh, that the U.S., and again, this is bipartisan criticism, that we are uh, sometimes, uh, uh, as a government, even though by far, by, uh, under President Bush, we are by far the largest donator of official development assistance. Um, and uh, I'm pretty sure we were under President Clinton as well. Um, a lot of times, not a lot of times, but sometimes you'll hear criticism that, well, you know what, but as a percentage of your economy, you're cheapskates, right? You, you are not uh, giving as much as you should. And there's a magic number that certain European countries focus on uh, that says, you, and, I don't, and to be honest, I don't know how the number came up, but you should give about 0.7% of your GDP as official development assistance. That's the target. We don't necessarily agree with that number, but again, it focuses very much on only government assistance is what matters. Our view is much broader. And our view is what matters is not only ODA, which we think is important, but what we consider the policies, the open policies that really uh, help with regard to total flows. And I always use the example, it's much more likely, at least in my experience, that a country, say Botswana, would much rather have uh, $5 billion in foreign direct investment from a comp companies in the United States and $5 billion in exports than they would $10 billion in ODA, some of which gets siphoned off in administrative uh, uh, um, usage and things like that. So if you look at, even as a percentage of GDP, what we call our total engagement, again, uh, total financial flows, in private and public, and the big one, which again, as Americans, I think most can be very proud of when you look at the private grants number, what private charities give overseas, and then you take that as a percentage of GDP, uh, it's quite an impressive story. And again, I think it is much more a reflection on people in this audience than it is uh, with regard to, to uh, any specific government policies. Next slide. The next area, I mentioned three at the outset that uh, we've had, a, I think, a very strong uh, record in is in opening markets and leveling the playing field uh, with regard to um, our businesses and private sector. Um, again, this is kind of in the wonky area of trade policy, but very important. In 2002, the president, uh, uh, and again, this has been incredibly bipartisan effort here. None of this happens without Congress. Um, but uh, uh, the, president, the president achieved trade promotion authority, it used to be known as fast track authority. That essentially enables the president to negotiate through his U.S. trade representative uh, trade agreements. You know, as you know, in the Constitution, that's a, an authority that lies with Congress. Receiving trade promotion authority lends that authority to the executive branch for a certain amount of time. Uh, we launched uh, with that trade authority the uh, develop, uh, Doha Development Agenda, the WTO Global Negotiations, which, uh, again, if, it, if these are still ongoing. But if you look at those numbers, a, com a successful completion of the Doha round, uh, there's all kinds of studies there that talk about the dramatic, dramatic reductions in global poverty that could bring around. And again, these are two, uh, two areas difficult. As you remember, the Clinton administration had a hard time in Seattle launching a global round. And I think the President Clinton tried three or four times to get fast track authority, trade promotion authority, was never, never able to do that. So with that authority, we have, uh, the administration has embarked on an extremely ambitious program of trade opening measures. And whether that's uh, trade preference programs, which is essentially programs that allow duty-free access of uh, significant parts of the developing world. Again, huge economic uh, drivers of growth in the developing world. These programs, the GSP program, what we call the ATPA, the African Growth and Opportunity Act, which was uh, started by President Clinton. Um, I mentioned here other kind of uh, um, uh, trade 
market opening uh, initiatives that we've undertaken. One, which is quite interesting, it relates to uh, cities like Baltimore that have a large uh, aviation presence, is the numerous open skies agreements that we've had. This is almost like free trade for the airline services uh, sector, and we've had many of those, including a historic one last year signed by Secretary Rice with the European Union. And so uh, in the process, we've also, in all these agreements, focused very much on uh, instituting and enforcing world-class IPR standards, all, all as part of our agreements. Next slide. Now, one area that I didn't mention, but is a huge area, huge area of the, the focus of the administration is in our negotiation of free trade agreements. Uh, again, you see there, prior to the Bush administration, we had two of those in force. Today, we have nine covering uh, 14 countries. The president just signed uh, the implementing legislation with the president of Peru on uh, Friday. So we actually have really 10 covering 15 countries. And you look at the numbers there, uh, these are very, very significant uh, markets, even though as a percentage of GDP, these countries uh, don't uh, make or, or do not constitute huge numbers as a percentage of our exports. Uh, it's actually very, very big numbers. And one, for example, I like the anecdote uh, with regard to Chile. We signed the U.S.-Chile FTA uh, in 2003, or I'm sorry, 2004, it went into force. Essentially, exports have been booming both ways since that, uh, since that agreement, and you're seeing that with several other of the free trade agreements that we have negotiated. Um, and again, uh, these free trade agreements are very thick, they're very detailed, they, uh, they, they really promote world-class standards, whether it's on investment protection, whether it's on IPR, whether it's on labor and environment, uh, we think that these are the top of the line agreements anywhere in the world. Um, and uh, as uh, Secretary Rice frequently uh, mentions, I don't know if, uh, I, I, I think I brought some, uh, did I? Yeah. Uh, a speech that she gave at the uh, Organization of American States recently, but with regard to our free trade agreements in Latin America, these are much more than just about trade. They are key, key elements of our foreign policy uh, in terms of helping uh, allies move to the rule of law, democracy, and it's a record that, again, I think is uh, quite strong. Next. So, and then uh, uh, the third area that I wanted to mention was in terms of global economic growth. As I, as I mentioned at the outset, there was the chapter six uh, of the national security um, strategy document talking about igniting a new era of global economic growth. Well, that happened. Um, you see there, uh, over the last six years, very respected economists on the, doesn't matter what side of the political spectrum, have talked about how this has probably been one of the most, if not the most, sustained deep periods of global economic growth uh, that the, that the uh, world has ever seen. Everybody reads about China and India, but what's really interesting, and in the double digit growth there, but what's been really interesting about that is that how this growth has really been everywhere. And you look at the numbers, whether it's Sub-Saharan Africa growing at over 5%, the Middle East, um, uh, Latin America. I mean, this has been, in, in countries you don't even read about, Turkey's been growing at plus 7%. Pakistan has been growing at plus 7%. This is very, very important, hugely important to our foreign policy. And as I mentioned there at the bottom, uh, constituting over, depending how you measure it, over 25%, almost close, closer to 30%, uh, we, the United States has been that global of that, uh, or has been the engine of that global economic growth over the last several years. Next slide. So um, I mentioned some numbers here. Uh, they pretty much speak for themselves, but essentially, despite uh, what started out at the beginning of the administration as a, uh, a recession, stock market bubble bursting, of course, the 9-11 attacks, which had a devastating impact on the economy for a while. Uh, you've seen about an average growth rate of around 3%, uh, really over the last six years. And numbers, again, whether it's with regard to budget deficit dropping, jobs created, these record, uh, these numbers are really as strong uh, as almost any other period. And uh, I note there, obviously, signs of uh, some turbulence in financial markets. 
But uh, we believe that the economic fundamentals uh, remain strong and that a hallmark of this economy has been the very, very uh, resilient nature um, of, the, of the growth. Next slide. Next slide. Now here is, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm going into a little bit of uh, prediction mode. So in five or six years, when you, when you read about dramatic, dramatic declines in global poverty levels, you could say you heard, you heard that here first. But there's obviously always a lag time. But what we are starting to see is that uh, primarily because of the dram dramatic increases in aid that I talked about, and it's not just us, but globally, but also primarily because of the strong, very strong, sustained global economic growth, you are seeing indications that this period, really the first decade of the uh, 21st century, is likely to be a period where there was substantial uh, poverty reduction. Now, as I mentioned, a global poverty reduction, there's a lag time in all these uh, indicators, so we don't have the strong numbers, but you're starting to see uh, anecdotes of what we think will be a story that's very strong, especially as we continue, uh, hopefully, that strong global growth of uh, significant declines in uh, global poverty. Next slide. OK, and so uh, the question I ask here, which most, most people in this room obviously would know, but why does this matter? Why does this record matter? Well, as I mentioned in that first bullet, Reducing poverty at home and abroad uh, is one of the core economic values of this country. That's what we've always stood for. Again, bipartisan, very much an issue that we, every administration is focused on. And we think that, uh, that a lot of that has happened uh, over the last six years. But there's actually a really kind of a, a more interesting element to this, and or not more interesting, but just a twist on this. And it's really, it's what, uh, what I mentioned up here is kind of the post 9-11 paradigm, why this matters. And you see, a, you see a quote from Secretary Rice, actually she had an op-ed in the Washington Post today with Senator Luger that in uh, a couple sections also made this point. But this notion that really prior to September 11th, we always viewed, and I think with good reason, the primary national security threats of the United States emanating from the large, big other global powers, whether global economic powers, whether it was Germany or Japan or the Soviet Union, that's pretty much during the last century where we focused. And this paradigm shift really caused by 9-11 uh, is this notion that now we recognize that many of our threats to our own national security don't just come from the large economic powers. Indeed, the post 9-11 period, it's almost flipped that 20th century paradigm on its head. And you're really starting to see where um, the threats to our national security emanate from some of the countries that are the most disconnected, the most weak from a governance standpoint and from an economic standpoint um, uh, in the world. And what's interesting is you see broad you're starting to see a lot of scholarship, a lot of commentary, again, very bipartisan, that looks at this paradigm shift and uh, what it means. And one of the things, from a, at least a, a strategic standpoint, uh, next slide, uh, it, this is um, uh, uh, Thomas Barnett. I don't know if some of you have read his book. I actually read it. I was quite impressed by it. The map's not perfect. I made sure I asked him permission to use his map during these uh, discussions. But what he does is he looks at where, uh, over the last really 20 years, the United States has sent troops, the most hardcore national security threats. And then he looks at how these areas are integrated into the global economy. And what he found, and again, it's not perfect when you look at what he calls the gap, the areas that you could quibble with. Every time I show this map, a lot of the first question is, well, I don't agree with uh, Thailand. And I, I think that's the, good points, that the map's not perfect. But the general thought is, in the areas where there is l the least amount of economic interconnection to other countries, to globalization, is that he found are the areas where we have, by and large, sent our troops the most amount of times. And it's a very interesting way of looking at this. So 
One of the things, if you look at all this, the, the policy initiatives that I reviewed uh, over the course of the last 20 minutes, one of the things that they're very much focused on is integration, is looking at developing countries, whether through the Doha uh, round of global negotiations, whether it's through our free trade agreements, whether it's through our open skies agreements, is to look at countries and help them integrate into the global uh, economic uh, system. And again, we think that has benefits from reducing poverty. We think that has actually has benefits in terms of increasing our own prosperity. But as I mentioned, the post 9-11 paradigm is really that has, there's a strong argument that has direct benefits on our own national security, given all that we've learned uh, uh, that's happened from September 11th on. Next slide. So uh, in conclusion, what I want to do is just briefly mention, again, um, some of the important work from our perspective that remains. Uh, and there's a lot more. And again, there's a lot of areas that I actually didn't cover in this presentation. But uh, as you can see, uh, I am, more importantly, I think the President and clearly the Secretary of State are very big supporters of the Millennium Challenge Corporation. Again, this notion of revolutionizing development assistance. Congress has been very supportive of that. And we are make, want to make sure that that uh, support continues, that it goes into the next administration, and anchored as a key element of the approach the United States takes to development assistance. Um, as I mentioned here, we have three remaining free trade agreements that have been negotiated, signed, completed, that need congressional ratification. Um, as I mentioned, Peru just happened, but one is with Panama, one is with Colombia, absolutely vital. Uh, to the foreign policy interests of the United States in the hemisphere. And again, I, I uh, want to commend you to the uh, speech that Secretary Rice gave recently at the OAS that hopefully you, you have copies of here, but really sets out the foreign policy imperative of these free trade agreements. And the third is uh, Korea, uh, one of our strongest allies in Asia, in a way to anchor and deepen that relationship in conjunction with the significant progress we've made uh, in the six-party uh, nuclear uh, talks in, in, in Korea. And then finally, I mentioned here two others finishing the Doha round for obviously uh, very, very important reasons to have another global trade round um, and to continue to address uh, what has been um, an issue that we have focused on is uh, the issue of global imbalances. Next slide. And uh, as I mentioned, just to uh, want to conclude on a note that I think is very important to stress. Uh, for those of you who follow debates in Washington, you do see strong debate on this issue of open markets, of trade, of globalization. You know, we've been working very hard on this, pat trying to uh, work with Congress on passing the Columbia Free Trade Agreement. But there are questions, and there are always questions, about the, the extent to which we should open our markets. But uh, I think when you look at the history, we have always been the leader of this system. We've benefited from this. We set this global economic system up after World War II. We've been the architect of that. And at least from my experience, uh, we, if the United States does not lead on these issues, there's no one else ready to. And again, we think that it's dramatically benefited our own country. Uh, and it's dramatically, dramatically benefited uh, most people around the world. And so um, as de the debates about this issue move on forward, take place as uh, groups such as this debate these issues, because they are contentious, uh, I think it is important to recognize that, to recognize that our leadership uh, in this global international economic area, from my perspective, is indispensable. It's been bipartisan, uh, and it's been a continued American tradition. The Secretary gave a speech in, at the New York Economic Club this past summer that talked about this. You put it in the terms of American realism and how uh, we need to maintain and focus on these principles because it's been a bipartisan path. And if we continue that focus and that leadership, that it's going to benefit uh, our country and many countries around the world. So. Um, I want to thank you for your attention uh, this evening. I hope, uh, hopefully, uh, you may have learned a little bit uh, on what I think, as you can tell, is a strong record.
uh, in this area, and I look forward to having a discussion and taking some questions. Thank you. Well, we appreciate your, your overview very much. Just, I probably should have earlier warned you, uh, we have to repeat the questions, which I'll do for the benefit of the, the uh, television okay. uh, videotaping. Yeah, sure. To, to what extent uh, are free trade agreements driven by the interests of special groups? Would you comment on that? Well, I think, I mean, I think it's a very legitimate question. But I think that the benefits from trade in these agreements uh, what, what, what's most interesting to me is having been to most of a lot of these countries where where we are uh, where we've done free trade agreements is the significant support from many sectors. I've been to Colombia. You talk to people. There's a, a huge support with regard to the free trade agreements uh, because um, not only is it an engine of economic growth, but if you look at, for example, the uh, example of Chile. The significant, I don't have the numbers uh, uh, at, at hand, but the significant drop in uh, poverty reduction that has occurred with regard to uh, the opening of their markets has been quite substantial. But I think, I, I think it's a very valid question. And it's a question that um, to maintain support for these policies, which we do, uh, and I think the evidence shows, benefit the societies that undertake these it's important to make sure that that question is addressed. And so one of the things, I was actually just in Latin America and uh, on a trip that's this, the, uh, with some colleagues of mine from the State Department and the Treasury Department. And our primary purpose on this trip was to look at ways to ensure that the benefits of trade are as broadly shared in societies as possible. Now, what does that mean? Obviously, with free trade agreements, the first companies, the first private sector ent entities that, that can really take advantage of dramatic reductions in tariffs are the ones that are already exporting. But how do you work to ensure that other companies, the small businessman, the small farmer, both here in Baltimore in the United States, but overseas, can also take advantage of those opportunities? A lot of his education, a lot of his access to credit, issues like this. So we were. It's a very good question because I would just spent the last 10 days in Latin America focusing on that very question. It's a very legitimate one, but I think um, the criticism that FTAs are simply uh, benefit just a few and uh, their only special interest benefit, um, I actually think is, uh, is, is disproved by the broad macroeconomic uh, benefits that usually accrue from these agreements. But, but it's something that we need to address as something that personally I've been very focused on addressing. The question, uh, to which I have no objection whatsoever, is uh, would you comment on uh, a Marshall Plan for the Palestinians being a kind of panacea? Uh, please. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me, um, actually, it's an uh, unbelievably timely question. As you probably, hopefully you saw on the news today, there was a Palestinian donors conference in Paris uh, that took place today. The Secretary of State, Condoleezza Rice, was the US representative there. I think there was over 60 countries that uh, participated. Uh, we played a very strong leadership role uh, in that conference. Uh, I'm pleased to say my principal deputy assistant secretary is over there right now with the secretary, my bureau's played a, a, a strong role in that conference. And I think, I'm looking at some of my colleagues here, they were supposed to give me the numbers before I got here. Uh, I think the, the, the total numbers in terms of what was raised was uh, upwards of $7 billion. So um, in some ways, I think what happened today, uh, and I think the US uh, contribution was uh, over a half a billion. Is that, is that right? I, I don't want to get these numbers wrong, but give or take. But uh, um, uh, so I think that uh, your question is very timely. And I think, obviously, a lot of people are thinking about the same question. As part of that um, uh, donor uh, conference, there is a reform program for uh, the Palestinian economy 
that has aspirational goals with regard to what they're trying to achieve. And uh, it's been a topic of intense interest uh, for the Secretary of State, who has taken a personal interest in actually previously uh, during her tenure as Secretary of State uh, negotiating or helping mediate some of the economic passage, uh, economic um, uh, elements of trade between the Palestinians and Israel, and to help them take advantage of uh, what is our free trade relationship uh, with the country of Israel. So um, I think that the economic development element of uh, the Middle East peace process is absolutely positively critical, as you mentioned. And I think today uh, was a very important coming together of the international community uh, on the donor side to really focus on that process in earnest. Do, the question is, do we, the United States, uh, get any goodwill benefit from the aid programs? I think the answer is unequivocally yes. Yes. Uh, I mean, I think that the, I think that the the PEPFAR program that I've mentioned that a lot of Americans don't know about, a lot of Africans do know about. I mean, we in that program, we have, uh, uh, I think, uh, I think the number is uh, over 1.1 million people have uh, uh, received antiretroviral treatment, life-saving treatment, because of uh, this program. And I think what's very interesting is in developing community, uh, I'm sorry, in the NGO community that focus on these issues, uh, uh, it, it's widely recognized um, uh, how much the administration is focused on this. So uh, to be honest, it's been a bit of a frustration, I think, with administration officials because uh, a lot of times when you talk about these programs, uh, whether it's with regard to um, uh, American audiences or audiences overseas that uh, they aren't aware of them. And I do think that we do, we do need to do a better job with regard to making people aware. But, um, you know, where we have large MCC programs or we have the PEPFAR program, uh, there is extreme uh, uh, significant appreciation for what the United States has done. And again, very bipartisan issue. It's not just the administration, it's the Congress. And uh, with regard to, um, well, I'll just leave it at that. Would you uh, comment upon uh, a nation's interest being crudely served in spite of our desire to uh, have them cooperate on an international level? Earlier you gave the example of uh, the Chinese and the Juan. And uh, the question is, uh, would you comment upon some nations not being fully cooperative on those matters? No, I think it's a, it's a, it's a great question. It's a big area of our focus. We just last week had the third, what was called the strategic economic dialogue between uh, senior cabinet officials uh, from the United States and uh, senior Chinese uh, minister, uh, senior Chinese ministers. And the, the, uh, the SED, which was launched by President Bush and President Hu Jintao, but is led by uh, Secretary Paulson, our Treasury Secretary, and uh, Madam Wu Yi, who's of uh, uh, number three um, uh, in the Chinese uh, government uh, is focused on addressing some of these long-term structural issues, problems that we have with the Chinese. And that is, a, that is a setting that is focused primarily on dialogue, working with the Chinese on uh, some of these important issues, whether it's intellectual property rights, whether it's subsidies, whether it's the, the uh, market-based flexible exchange rates that the Secretary of the Treasury has been encouraging. And so that's one approach. We think it's from the long-term benefit of both countries to have that dialogue, to gain the trust, to focus on that. The results of the last uh, uh, SED last week, uh, I think, were important, made some progress. But dialogue doesn't always work. And so one of the other areas that we have been very forceful in is when countries don't play by the rules internationally from our perspective. If a dialogue doesn't work, then we have, but particularly with regard to China, that brought WTO actions against them with regard to intellectual property rights. Uh, we have 
two pending right now. Uh, we just settled. Uh, our U.S. Trade Representative, uh, Sue Schwab, just settled a major, major WTO case with regard to the Chinese that we brought against them that had, uh, with regard to their subsidies in a number of different uh, critical uh, sectors of their economy, and we got an agreement for them to stop this. So we have brought, I don't have the numbers uh, uh, offhand, but we have been very aggressive when we need to be, whether it's WTO cases, whether it's our anti-dumping and countervailing duty cases, uh, where we think countries are not playing by the rules, and we will continue to do that. Um, so, and the concern from the administration's standpoint on how that affects uh, American competitiveness, how that affects companies and uh, workers uh, in cities like Baltimore is very high, which is why our approach has been, we talk, we focus on it, we try and resolve this, but if we can't uh, get satisfaction through dialogue, uh, we have been not at all adverse to uh, taking significant actions, whether it's in the WTO or within our own trade laws, to uh, rectify those problems. So, and it's something we'll continue to focus on. Uh, should the uh, government of the United States be more active in, uh, with respect to issues like uh, lead-in toys and uh, uh, uncompetitive labor advantages in other countries? Yeah. No, very, very uh, uh, good questions and important questions. I think on the import safety side, there has been a focus uh, on this. Um, obviously, you see the, the articles with regard to recalls. Um, uh, and that's one area, but I think the more important area is what we're doing, again, from our own uh, strategy and with regard to reaching, working with other countries and how to address that issue. Some countries, we've obviously had, uh, we have very kind of similar interests. We were cooperating uh, with the European Union on some of these issues because they have had similar problems. We've looking at ways to help strategize that on a global basis. but. Uh, uh, as I mentioned, we had the strategic economic dialogue uh, just last week in China, and the, and the key, one of the key outcomes of that was an agreement that we signed with the Chinese with regard to import safety. And what that does is it looks at trying to implement some of the recommendations. The Secretary of Health and Human Services um, recently chaired the uh, import safety working group that the President convened after a lot of these problems to look at ways in which we can both uh, uh, increase the safety of our imports, but not only at the border, but really through a more a, a systematic approach. The notion that we're going to be able to inspect our way out of this problem is something that we think is probably policy that is not going to be successful. What these recommendations have done is to look at a more systematic approach with regard to uh, uh, private suppliers with, the pri with regard to the supply chain and how to look at that as, it's, as products are being developed and as they're being imported. And part of the agreement that we had uh, last week, actually two agreements with China, uh, we think is an important start uh, to implementing that. But it is a, it is a serious concern. It's a, it's a concern that in Latin America I was raising with countries. So it's something that I think um, uh, is very high on the agenda on the international side, and it's something that was a uh, significant element of the discussions in Beijing with uh, several cabinet uh, members, including our uh, HHS uh, secretary last week. With regard to the uh, labor issue, I think, as I mentioned here, it is something that we're focused on. Our free trade agreements have uh, very high labor and environmental standards that are enforceable now under uh, these new free trade agreements, which is a significant significant advance over previous agreements. And I think that the concerns about how we compete against that, uh, um, uh, uh, the, the lower wage labor, is a, is a significant concern. It goes back to one of the comments I made earlier about the importance of education. I mean, the US, the American worker, although makes a lot more than the Chinese or Indian worker, is still the most productive worker uh, in the world. And with education, and with uh, um, increasing focus on that, we think that that is a way to compete, not to close markets. What are the economic opportunities provided by the uh, removal of, or the end of Mr. Castro's control in Cuba? 
Well, I think uh, what we'll be focusing on the end of the Castro um, uh, regime, uh, as you mentioned, uh, is the return to uh, democracy to the island and the, and the Cuban people. That's going to be the primary focus. I think uh, you see that I would imagine, I'm not a, an expert with regard to Cuba, but I would imagine that the, um, both from an investment standpoint and the economic opportunity standpoint, as we address that very important of the return to democracy, will be substantial. And I uh, would almost certainly uh, venture that regardless of what administration is in power, that the government of the United States uh, will be very focused on that element of restoring democracy uh, to the island. Because as you know, the economic development side and the political democracy side uh, often go hand in hand. Um, do you see the uh, a Marshall Plan um, having a positive impact upon other aspects of the debate over the future of, of uh, Palestine? I think the economic well-being and development uh, with regard to the Palestinian people will be is a, is a critical element of moving forward with regard to uh, successful Middle East peace negotiations. And I think that's why you saw the Secretary of State today playing a very important global leadership role uh, on the Palestinian Donor Conference. And again, I think on a lot of these issues, whether it's security issues, whether it's political issues, or whether it's economic issues, at least from the perspective that we often view them, is they are so often interlinked that they have benefits. And when there's, when there's little economic opportunity, downsides to what you're trying to achieve politically, what you're trying to achieve from a security perspective. It's an issue that, for example, I've been working on quite a lot with regard to Pakistan and the border area of Afghanistan and Pakistan, where we've been very focused, again, you don't read a lot about it, on bringing economic opportunity to these areas because it's so critical in terms of both uh, security and even political development. So I think that uh, uh, the question you ask, I think the answer is yes. And these issues are integrated. And that's why, again, you saw the Secretary of State playing a very important role today at the conference, which turned out to be uh, quite successful. Uh, we're very sorry that we have to end the evening, but we do thank you so much for sharing thank your you. expertise with us. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot.